So uh, welcome everybody to this last webinar of OA Week. It's been a fantastic week and I'm really thrilled that we've got such a fantastic panel to finish off the week with. Um, uh, my name's Ginny Barber. I'm the director of Open Access Australasia. Um, I am just doing the logistics at this point. So the usual will be recording this as you'll have heard. Um, please mute your microphone and keep your camera turned off unless you're one of our panelists, obviously. Uh, please do try, type questions into the chat. This is going to be a lively discussion, so feel free to um, yeah, put in questions for the, for the panel and Thomas will be uh, moderating that and we'll aim to finish on the hour. So I'm really delight delighted to pass over to Thomas Shaffey, who is um, uh, on the organising committee for Open Access Australia's OA Week. Um, he's from Swinburne, a uh, sort of incredible Wikipedia, Wikimedia person, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to this panel. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to remind everyone that um, uh, we all are going to be situated on the lands of various Indigenous peoples, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, I am currently situated on the Indigenous lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, which is the, the, the case for most people in Melbourne. Um, so I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, uh, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to uh, extend a particular welcome to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander um, uh, Maori or other First Nations peoples who are joining us here today and um, as is common in these sorts of digital scenarios of course we're all situated in different locations so I invite people to um, uh, indicate in the chat um, where they're joining us from. So for this session we're going to be covering a range of topics related to uh, Wikimedia in general, we'll start off kind of maybe a bit more narrow scope with Wikipedia and then broaden that to some of the sister projects that um, have come out of that same ecosystem and their relevance for climate research and their relevance for um, the open knowledge movement more broadly. Um, so I'm joined by three panellists today, um, and unfortunately one uh, additional panellist who wasn't able to make it but has uh, very kindly sent in a short video summary of some of the key points he was looking forward to raising. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Dickinson, uh, Andrew Leung, and Siobhan Leachman. Um, Andrew is joining us from over the opposite side of the world in Canada, and then both Mike and Siobhan are over in New Zealand. Um, so can I ask you to each introduce yourselves briefly, uh, starting with Siobhan? Hi, I'm Siobhan. I'm a Wikimedian um, and also a citizen scientist. I do a lot with um, iNaturalists in New Zealand and also um, am very keen on writing Wikipedia articles on both women in STEM and also New Zealand endemic species. Um, and Andrew? Uh, hello, my name is Andrew Long. I am uh, with, uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I have been editing Wikipedia for about 16, 17 years. And uh, well, in my daytime job, I'm a physical scientist with the Climate Archives. And yeah, I, I often use the climate data, uh, data, not just only on Wikipedia, but all, on, also on other sister projects like Wiki Voyage and Commons. And I'll, I'll be very happy to talk about some of the work that our work unit has done. Uh, and finally, Mike. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, ko Mike Dickerson tōko ingoa no Otatahi Aho. I'm from Christchurch in the South Island. I've just finished a contract with the Westland District Library as a digital librarian, but I'm basically a freelance Wikipedian. In a previous life, I was a museum curator and in charge of a collection of giant flightless birds, which is uh, my handle on Wikipedia. Thank you. Thanks, and I shall um, now share that aforementioned video uh, introduction from um, uh, our panelist who was sadly not able to make it. So share sound, optimize for video clip and share. And uh, please let me know if you don't see this. Hi, I'm Alex Stenson, and uh, I want to apologize for not being able to attend this panel. Uh, something in my life came up where I'm not going to have access to internet tonight. Uh, unfortunately, this presentation was going to be at my midnight, uh, and I was hoping to be there, but I unfortunately I can't make it work. 
Um, I'm so excited you're having this conversation about the role of Wikipedia and communicating about the climate crisis and other kinds of environmental issues. I think it's really important, especially as we celebrate Open Access Week about climate justice, to think about who gets what content about uh, the climate change. As you know, like uh, most research, most academic research is being published in a few languages like English and and Spanish and Chinese. And these languages are easily accessible to uh, a, a few kind of geographies and groups of people. Um, however, the, the world is made of people who need access to, to climate content um, in many, many other languages. As we know, the climate crisis involves billions of decisions about changes we need to make in the world right now. Um, and these billions of decisions are made with people of all levels of society. Uh, sometimes they're, uh, you know, local policymakers, sometimes they're, they're local community members, sometimes they're a farmer. Um, and each of these kinds of folks uh, need information that's contextual in their own language, in their own Con uh, reflecting their own context. And so using a platform like Wikipedia to summarize academic content, scientific content, Wikidata, other Wikimedia projects, and pushing them into uh, local languages, local contexts, uh, describing, for example, the fact that uh, cities like Miami are going to have extreme flooding problems in the article about Miami on Wikipedia really adds a lot of value. Um, I did a little bit of research last year to understand exactly how this works uh, in in our, our Wikimedia projects, and what we uh, found is that every year uh, Wikipedia Wikimedia projects have over 240 million page views uh, to sorry 340 million page views to climate explicit content uh, like articles explicitly about climate change topics. Um, every year, but over 60% of that was to non-English content. The world is asking a lot of questions about the climate crisis and platforms like Wikipedia and their connection to things like Google and, and search results make it really, really good platform for sharing this information with people in their own language, about their own context. Um, I wrote a blog series recently uh, about this kind of action, this kind of change. It's called uh, uh, The Organizer's Perspective, and I'll share a link with Thomas so that he can share it with you all. Um, and it's really uh, what we found is that kind of organizing open access, the open movement around activist topics like climate change is actually a really effective way to recruit people. And what we've seen on Wikipedia and on other platforms is just that. Um, if you do outreach about the climate crisis, if you do outreach about human rights, uh, th there's a real opportunity to invite people in. For example, um, there's a recently funded project by the Pointer Foundation in uh, Africa by Code for Africa that's focusing on the fighting disinformation in the African context on Wikipedias. This is a really powerful opportunity to not only do it in English and French and other colonial languages in the African context, but also in local African languages where there's not a lot of content on the internet to begin with, where it is much easier for climate disinformation to proliferate. Open access platforms, and I'm sure Mike and Shaban and Andrew will explain this as we kind of discuss it, Open access platforms like Wikipedia really put a lot of power in the hands of people who don't know quite yet what to do about the climate crisis by making small edits, by making those small edits really happen um, in a way that, you know, the public gets climate communication. I think it's absolutely critical that every one of us interested in open science, open communications, open knowledge needs to make the effort to to pivot towards climate research and knowledge sharing uh, with climate communications is absolutely critical to to the billions of decisions that we have to have uh, happen to mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis. Um, as part of that, I'm in a group called Open Climate from uh, the uh, that's a network of uh, open organizations, including Apropedia, Open Environmental Data, where we've been putting together essays, uh, kind of talking about how open uh, can collaborate with the climate crisis, uh, climate movement. 
climate movement needs guidance from academics and scientific and scholarly communicators about how to share the best knowledge in the most context in uh, every language. And so I'm, I'm really excited for these conversations we're having for Open Access Week this week. And again, huge apology. Life changed on me uh, quite unexpectedly in the last few weeks. And I, I hope you have um, a great conversation as part of your meeting. Thanks. So I think that that frames a lot of the key issues that we're going to talk about. Um, and one of the first ones that I wanted to bring up with my uh, panelists that we've got here today is actually the issue of language. We were talking about this a little bit before the um, uh, before we everyone came into the meeting because it also came up at the last session um, uh, in the context of research about um, Samoan people being researched by English speaking researchers who then publish in English, but not Samoan. Um, and so one of the things that I want to um, ask of my current panelists is what experience they have in the context of Wikipedia outside of English language and how that in, uh, and how that interacts with English and maybe how that interacts with other languages. Uh, so I'll throw that to Andrew first. And then sure. people can yep. jump in afterwards. Yep. So uh, for in, in my workplace, Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is the equivalent for the Australia's uh, Bureau of Meteorology, uh, because we're a government, uh, be, because our uh, we do have both English and French being the official languages of Canada, so we have an obligation to publish uh, our website in both English and French. So what that means is even for like a scientific article, there is an expectation that we have to provide the, the French version of the, even though if the entire article uh, is in English. So we, our expectation is we have to provide the abstract and also say the keywords and also the, uh, the, the title of the, of the research has to be in both languages. So that makes it, uh, that makes it much a little bit uh, a little bit more complicated when you when you basically have to maintain two different sets of the version of the website, given that it's the same kind of content. Uh, however, because in French you also have to, a little bit of a difference in the decimal place because they use like comma instead of a, a instead instead of a of a period for uh, for for anything uh, smaller than like uh, in the. Uh, proceeding uh, decimals. So uh, it creates a little bit of a challenge when we try to export data out outside uh, for, for CSVs. So what and um, what we found is that uh, when we actually release our pro uh, our data onto comments, uh, Wikimedia comments, uh, it is much easier to translate because they already have all those plugins built in where it is very easy for us to just simply click on a button and then start translating uh, content right away. And in fact, the original announcements was written in French and all I have to do is just click on the English and then just start started translating into the, uh, the, the whole announcements into English. Hmm. I wanted to also ask of uh, of Siobhan and Mike, have either of you had experience in the Maori language Wikipedia? That's a difficult topic, unfortunately. Um, there is indeed a Maori language Wikipedia, but it's basically a stagnant project. And that reflects the fact that there are actually very few editors in Maori or of Maori descent who are comfortable in writing in Maori in the Wikipedia world. And that's a uh, testimony to the fact that the organization, the movement in New Zealand has actually been quite insular until recently. We haven't been very organized and there hasn't been much of a move to embrace diversity or welcome people in from outside the traditional, you know, white middle-class male Wikipedia base. Uh, but they're one of the comforting, one of the announcements of the newly formed Wikimedia Aotearoa movement is to try and increase diversity and recruit more Māori members. And at that point, um, Māori should be taking over the Māori language Wikipedia and, and using it. Um, it is one of the official languages of New Zealand. Uh, but it is also worth noting that even for um, topics affecting other countries, many language speakers go to the English language Wikipedia uh, as well as to their own language um, community, because the English language Wikipedia is generally larger and more fully researched. 
so it is really important to make sure the content is there and strong in English first, uh, as well as um, making it multilingual. Uh, but this is something that's often overlooked in Wikimedia community movements, is that there are many speakers of many languages in most communities around the world, and it is an excellent task for new editors, for beginners, to work on translation and making articles in as many of the 300 different languages that have a Wikipedia as possible. And one of the things that I think is also worth flagging, actually, is not just um, uh, the issue of translation, but also of localization. So, uh, you know, uh, an example might be something like um, sea level rise. The English Wikipedia is most likely to have examples in its sea level rise article that are relevant, most relevant to English speakers, primarily Americans. And I strongly suspect that at least half of the examples listed on the sea level rise Wikipedia page um, in English are going to be about English speaking countries, which are totally valid examples, but might not be the most useful local examples, for example, for someone in Fiji someone in Uruguay. The localized examples, it's, it's not just a case of straight up translation as you might do of, for example, a Google Translate of an English language Wikipedia page. It's also localization to the specific issues, specific topics, specific examples of the relevant language communities. But I also see that it's been quite a good strength of Wikipedia, not so much the big articles, but you've also got articles on particular places that can then have sections about climate change and about the effects of climate change in your particular city or your particular town or your particular region. There's no reason why there can't be a section on every uh, you know, location that might have an effect via climate change. I actually had a look recently at the Wellington um, Wikipedia page and checked see whether there was anything as a particular section. There's a couple of comments, but I know that there's been studies done in Wellington on the effect of um, sea level um, increases as a result of climate change on our local area and our city and flooding. And, you know, it, the same again for Nelson, which just had horrific flooding, um, which is my hometown. And that definitely now needs a, 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 a section to explain what's going on and why things like that happen. Yeah, I think you see that as a strength because you can actually edit to each individual article in Wikipedia and then hopefully they'll, they'll get translated into multiple languages or the other way around. There's no reason why it can't be the other way around as well. And there's also another thing about uh, one, first of all, is the reliability of the data uh, where you see those uh, water boxes or that presents in a, in a graphical for, uh, format. But what I often find is that a lot of times they are coming from some website that we don't know it, of, of the data quality where it is coming from. Or if it is reliable, sometimes they may be actually 10 or 20 years out of date because they were that was the last available data published in some mm. like book format that someone has a copy of this book but then when they gone digital then it kind of went into behind the closed closed walls and they and and they don't make that available i think we have that uh one of my re, uh my researcher uh, was doing research in the amazon in uh, uh in in peru and had he actually have to c c come up with like a customized script to basically kind of do uh do crawl on the on the website to do one query at a time to pull the website uh, from the Peruvian Pruvi, uh, mm. uh, data where he actually uh, works for several years in the in the government. So uh, if you don't have that kind of uh, intimate corporate no or, or governmental knowledge, uh, inside knowledge, you wouldn't even know that these data exist. Uh, and we're not even we're we're not even getting to the point of whether the data it's it's up to date. Mm. That's but very in good the point. New Zealand. Sorry, but in the New Zealand case, much of the sea level rise impact has been released in comprehensive public reports quite recently. Um, to follow up something Alex mentioned, not only is uh, climate change and inequality a powerful motivator for getting editing, volunteer editing communities organised and getting them to work, local is also powerful. So the combination of the two, looking at the effect of climate change on your own local town or coastline uh, would be a fantastic organizing principle for a public community editathon to try and improve that coverage. 
And if it's there's public uh, reports and information out there, just bringing all those together would be uh, a marvellous way to get this open knowledge up into Wikipedia. And actually, I want to pick up on the aspect of um, uh, kind of coverage, up to datedness, and, and reliability, because we, we're, you know, I think we have a tendency to talk about Wikipedia as a monolith, and you know, particularly within the English-speaking you know world, we speak about English Wikipedia as um, a, a monolith. But I wanted to ask your opinions on um, which parts of the uh, of the encyclopedia do you find the most up to date, the most uh, reliable, the most trustworthy, the most well referenced, um, and which are the areas of the encyclopedia that you've noticed are the most inconsistent or gappy or, or becoming out of date and, and um, require in many ways more editor attention. Well, from my personal perspective. Um, I do note that the bigger concepts, the general ideas, the say the climate change um, article, for example, are very well covered, have a lot of um, Wikipedia editor eyes on it, check the references, check for vandalism, make sure it's up to date. The more editors you've got who are interested in a particular article and look after it, the better that article is. Whereas, say, an article like um, a small town in New Zealand that may disappear as a result of, um, you know, sea level rising, um, the, the Wikipedia um, editors in New Zealand, there's not actually that many of us in comparison to many other parts of the world. And there may only be one person who is looking regularly at the article and looking after it. So as a result, it will just be that one person's effort to keep it up to date. And they may, you know, they may fall by the wayside and it may sit there for two, three years without anybody updating it. So there are definite gaps and it's a matter, I think, of just trying to get as many people interested in these types of subjects and putting eyes on articles. The more people who can contribute, the better. Uh, yep, I, I definitely agree with that sentiment uh, in uh, in Canada, we also noticed a very similar thing. Uh, the pages that are well frequented, like Toronto, Vancouver, those get mm. those get updated all the time. But when we start looking into villages in the middle of nowhere or in the north, uh, so I actually uh, pasted the link in the chat, which is where the project is. And if you see the see our our distribution of the weather stations, they are all concentrated towards the southern part of Canada, which is where about 40% of all the population is, li is living at. Whereas if you look in the Arctic, there is very there there is very few stations up there, and uh, the data is often not up to date when you're looking in a, in the villages of like say 500 600 people uh not only is the is the weather data out of date it may be like one or even two census date, uh, out of date in terms of even population for example so that's uh so i also noticed the same pattern mm. yeah no that's those that's really valid points uh, i'd like to if i may share my screen and sort of illustrate this uh in another way so you'll see that yeah um so last week i was at this um, climate protest uh it's a protest against trying to turn this area we're all standing in the deniston plateau on the west coast of new zealand into new zealand's second largest open cast coal mine uh new zealand's first largest overcast open cast coal mine is just over that ridge there uh and as was usual in this sort of, so this was organized by the Forest and Bird Protection Society. So a climate lobby group organized many of us to come to this rather inaccessible spot. Uh, and a drone camera flew up and took, took some nice footage of us and we all waved our fists and chanted. Uh, and there was some nice, nice photography and it, it appeared for a few seconds on the evening news that night. And that was counted as a win. Uh, the problem the the footage itself uh was not actually released by forest and bird under an open license they did not even get the metadata right it's just sitting in a dropbox somewhere so it's not actually repurposable or usable by anyone else i took this i raced out from behind the the uh, banner and took this photograph here and in fact took a lot of photographs of the deniston plateau um, the flora the fauna most of these are mine um, and the landscape. Um, 
because there was no Wikipedia article about the Deniston Plateau until recently. Uh, the, all the discussion of it uh, on the media over 10 years, um, the opposition to a new coal mine going up, there had been plenty of pre press releases by Forrest and Bird and they're on their own website, but nobody had thought to take the time to just make a simple article about this actually quite significant area, uh, which was the subject of a bio blitz. They discovered seven new species just on this plateau, only one of which has been scientifically described. Uh, so I wrote this. Um, and uh, I think this is actually a really important point, is that we need to try and remember that Wikipedia as an outlet for some quite important climate um, topics. In some areas, there just it's, it simply doesn't exist. There's nothing at all until you can get activists uh, to take part and actually create this. And this is by no means an activist article. This is an encyclopedic article that only has one section at the end here um, that talks about the threats um, from the coal mine. But it's really important to have that baseline knowledge out there. And now I can actually add um, that photograph to it. There we go. I'll put a caption in later. And we should be able to, there, that looks all right. Yeah. So I can now add that to the article and um, then we will actually be able to stop sharing. Um, gradually improve the coverage of, and the bring up to date the, the latest proposals to turn into a coal mine. But that's the case in many environmental issues, at least around New Zealand, or and certainly in, I'm sure in the developing world, is that they simply don't exist in Wikipedia. So someone who's doing a Google search for information on that topic will get maybe press releases by an activist organization, a lobby organization, but people who are vaguely savvy um, will probably discount that as perhaps that's biased or perhaps that's not the whole truth. Uh, whereas people tend to trust Wikipedia a lot more at delivering a balanced overview of a topic because indeed that's one of its principles is to you know try and tell all the different sides, all the different perspectives on a topic. So it would be it was a real opportunity loss that this lobbying organization didn't take the trouble to release its photographs under an open license or mm. engage with Wikipedia, and yet a huge amount of time and effort and expense was spent producing something that to them only appeared for a few seconds on the news and then is lost forever. So that's my sort of perspective on, on coverage and, and how what we can do to try and rectify that imbalance. I'm also going to quickly highlight something here that um, I think almost may have passed a lot of people by because it, we're within the Wikipedia community. I think we're so used to this. The way that conversation often flows is discussing a topic, finding out more information about that topic, and also simultaneously editing Wikipedia <laughs> to update it on that topic. And so I'm quite used to this as seeing, you know, for example, Mike just casually like adding images to Wikipedia, editing Wikipedia, improving it during this conversation. But I think that that's in many ways quite alien to the experience of a lot of people outside mm -hmm. of, of that niche community, you know, particularly within research. We're used to, a, in many ways, a much slower timeline of how we do our thinking and research. We're also used to a much narrower scope of people we're expecting to talk to. And again, you know, Mike highlighted there this this idea of, I mean, this wasn't a, a, an academic group; it was a, a, you know, a conservationist um, group. But producing materials that they put a lot of work into that end up being used once and forgotten, or end up getting shared only uh, uh, by you know specific request. Um, and since uh, Wikimedia Commons has just been brought up, maybe let's chat a little bit about that side of things. So for for people who haven't you know aren't explicit on the separation wikipedia is the encyclopedia wikimedia commons hosts the images sounds videos other media files to get used across different language versions of wikipedia and other projects as well um i'd be quite interested in um people's experiences with wikimedia commons um and maybe also moving like moving media from other locations onto Wikimedia Commons for the purposes of sort of more broadly 
sharing and getting greater kind of reach and impact from that material? Well, that's something that I did quite a bit of. Um, I spend a lot of my time editing um, species articles and a lot of um, endangered species or endemic species to New Zealand, which can possibly be either under threat or endangered. There's a lot of them. There's more than most people would realise. And um, I tend to try and write these articles in order to raise awareness that these species are under threat. And it could be under threat for several reasons, including climate change. Um, and uh, we'll write these articles in order to make them um, more, make the information more available to um, the public to realise, uh, you know, that one, this is a, an endemic species only found in New Zealand. It might only be found in a particular region of New Zealand. Two, why it's under threat, you know, or that we just don't have enough data about the species to know whether it's under threat. And in order to do that, I like, because a picture really is worth a thousand words, I love to illustrate these articles with images of the species. And often the only way I can get an image is either through a museum, if I'm lucky enough, they have openly licensed their images, some don't, some have the dreaded non-commercial use um, Creative Commons license on them or just copyright it in which case I cannot reuse them in, um, and put them into Wiki Commons for reuse in Wikipedia. Um, if, but I really ideally like uh, an image of a live specimen, you know, a live animal or a live plant, not pressed and dead, so that you can actually see the glory of the species. And I tend to get my images from iNaturalist. There are, although the default license on that platform is again the, the non-commercial use license. There are plenty of naturalists who realize um, they want their images to be reused in all sorts of platforms and so will generously license their images um, much more openly and then I can download them from my naturalist nor I tend to take the images that have been um, Re achieved research grade, which means that someone has come along and said, yes, not only do you think that species is that species, I do too. And I tend to look at the person who does that and work out their expertise. So I'm, I'm carefully curating the images before I actually upload them to check who's actually saying, yes, this definitely is that species. But when I'm happy with the level of you know, research gradeness, I take that image, I upload it into Commons, and then I reuse it so that people will actually know what that species looks like. But you're lucky because it can work the other way. iNaturalist has this fantastic symbiotic relationship with Wikipedia because it ingests the Wikipedia article back into the species page on iNaturalist. So when I write these articles, um, it can be used by the naturalist using the iNaturalist Citizen Science app to read up and to try and work out whether it actually is that species when they spot something. And if I can, can't find images on iNaturalist, I might use, I've used illustrations, 100 year old illustrations, because that's the only image I can find. And I'll ingest that into iNaturalist too, so that instead of a black box, the, any naturalist actually has some idea about what they're looking for. Oh, it's a moth with orange underwings. I know it's a pencil drawing. It may not be 100% accurate, but at least I can go, oh, the one I saw has uh, orange underwings, possibly this one, and it helps guide and improve their data. So yeah, that's how I tend to use the uh, one of the areas I get my, my images from. Can I just reply to a question from Zach in the, the chat? Uh, this is a common stumbling point. People don't realize that um, an image that's released openly uh, but under a Creative Commons non-commercial only license isn't actually usable by Wikipedia. That's because all the content in Wikipedia is deliberately made to be openly shareable and usable by anyone for any purpose. And that might include a commercial use or, some, or a profit-making entity. Uh, and so any photos that aren't released under that very open license can't be used in it. And that's a really important part of how Wikipedia works. And so there's, um, in fact, I see Richard White is, is here in the audience. Um, Rich has just done a very nice article about why that reflexive knee-jerk, non-commercial only uh, usage stamp that researchers often use on their images is actually perhaps not the best 
tack to take. And this is just one of the reasons why. Um, if anyone could put the link to that recent um, article, thank you, mate. Um, it would be great if you could you could put something in there, Richard, about your, your topic. Uh, can I follow up from Siobhan about the use of images of species? Um, I can, I'll share my screen again, um, if I can. There we go. So there's a weekly radio show in New Zealand called Critter of the Week that's been running since 2015 and highlights um, endangered or strange or obscure New Zealand species. And we have a small team of Wikipedia volunteers now, including Siobhan, uh, who each week try and check to make sure there is an actual Wikipedia article about this supposed wonderful species that they're putting the spotlight on. And as you can see, this is going back, this project's been going for quite some time now. Uh, but one of the perennial problems we have is finding a usable photo of some things. Amazingly, it could be a critically endangered species. There's not actually an openly licensed photo that we can share. Uh, and so this was the this this one uh, actually it was just a couple of hours ago. It was on the radio. This has already come up. Uh, it's uh, the largest luminescent vertebrate. It's the kite fin shark, a deep sea shark that has an amazing glowing body. And you'll notice that the photograph here that the radio, this is on Radio New Zealand's website, uh, is licensed to these three researchers, CC by four. Why is that? Because this is the article that they published last year on this, and it includes those wonderful photographs and some others as well. And as you see at the bottom, that they have chosen to put a Creative Commons attribution license on it. And so that means that we can reuse those photographs not just on the Radio New Zealand website, but I can now take that photograph and add it to the Wikipedia article about the kite fin shark and talk about their research, cite their research, which will give them, you know, altmetrics dings, uh, but also brings their research to a much wider uh, body or a much wider audience than would probably have stumbled across this paper on bioluminescence. So there's real, really strong arguments for making sure that images, and what might even seem obscure to you, like you know, gra technical graphs and so forth, are actually released under an open license because they can be reused by multiple organizations like radio stations mm -hmm. and it appear in Wikipedia. And for, particularly for endangered species, we've found that, that it's surprising how poor and how few the photos are. Uh, yep. Uh, going on to the mic, uh, I think that's uh, that's generally a problem for almost all non-U.S. Uh, species, just given that U.S. government by default releases all, all the content in public domain. Uh, that's certainly also an issue in Canada here. Because, uh, we're slowly starting to, uh, to towards that, but COVID just kind of put a lot of the a lot of the initiative on pause uh, because everyone was just scrambling for something else. And I just want to go, uh, kind of loop back uh, about the about the usage of comments. Originally, we tried to decide between whether uploading the data uh, the the weather data directly onto Wikipedia, uh, given that uh, when we tried to brief the the deputy minister on our initiative, when you start explaining what is a Wikimedia Commons, the good the the saying goes when you start explaining, you really lost half the battle. So uh, we we really we really fought hard about it, but then we realized that because we have to do it in both English and French, the only realistic way to do this in a, in in a in a cost effective and also effort effective way is to upload it on the comments. Uh, so we actually have to re, uh, we actually have to create like a script to up the, uh, to update the to create like a connection like an API to. Uh, back to bulk upload the data on the comments, but there's still always the issue of uh, maintaining it or whenever there is, it needs to update. Uh, mm -hmm. Manual update, like if you if anyone just click on the button to edit, it is very cumbersome and it's almost impossible unless you actually have the interface to upload. Uh, but we do we do from time to time because our, our work unit does like quality control on the data and uh, and sometimes when we notice error, like the extreme highs or, or like rainfall or snow, and we actually have to take it out, well, there becomes like a disconnect between the official source, which is on the website, and whatever is available on the comments, because uh, we we do not upload it on on a real time basis. Whereas on the website, 
we we actually have a script that runs every uh, around uh, around eleven o'clock in the in the evening to actually up, up, upload and update the, the latest data from yesterday. So there's still a little bit. Uh, so there on the query side, it's definitely more powerful if you uh, because uh, the data is now available on comments, which enable wiki data type of query. Uh, uh, and also searching, but when it comes to like uh, data integrity, uh, the official website, if there's still there is still work to be done. Now, Andrew, you mentioned Wikidata there, and that's another one of these sister projects to Wikipedia that I think um, is less in the forefront of people's minds. So I wondered if you or uh, one of our other panelists would be happy to give a sort of a brief um, I, I guess definition of what Wikidata is and what its relevance is to some of these discussions around you know, climate change, biodiversity, and so on. Yeah, I I don't know too much on Wikidata other than just doing like uh, data entries and such. But from my understanding, it's kind of like a it gives like a structured uh, structured format so that uh, in a, in a computer uh, e easily like a computer easily uh, done way so that a computer could understand it. Uh, and one of the one of the, the challenge we have is that uh, I think there's still not as much uh, knowledge about Wikidata at at that time. So uh, we we kind of like we we have to we have a lot of the attributes for the describe the data like the metadata about the station about the weather station itself, like the latitude longitude. Those are uh, those are added. I think actually it's like a metadata inside comments and not and and not actually like a wiki data item. I, I may be wrong here, uh, but I think that I think there's still like a it's definitely not up to date uh, compared to our uh, compared to the official website. But uh, what I notice is that when we bring the data in just into comments as opposed to on Wikipedia, that enables not just different languages of Wikipedia to use it, but also Wiki Voyage, which is like a, the, the the companion travel guide. We could uh, where I also edit. We could also use the same information for travelers who are visiting like another country and they want to look up like, well, how often does it rain in say December? Or, or or what is the average temperature when I try to, when I want to visit in July? Uh, those information will also be uh, replicated if if it's pulling from the same source. So you don't need to go into every single version of Wikipedia and different languages in Wiki Voyage to to upload uh, to update it whenever there's a change. You just go straight into comments and update that information, and that it get automatically calculated and populated all uh, spread all across all the projects. So that's there's definitely a merit in that. Yeah, yeah I do I quite a bit of. Sorry, Mike, do you want to go? No, you, you go. You're, you're okay, I, I do quite a bit of um, work in Wikidata. It's a it's a basically a magic database. <laughs> it is amazing. It's structured data, so it's all linked in together, and it's also a data hub. So you create items for concepts. And I do a lot of items for species, for example, or improved species items. And then not only do you have the information about the species there, you've also got a way to connect to other um, databases. And so it connects, the Wikidata can also act as a hub. So you can go from, say, for example, I don't know, a particular species of moth, it may have um, various statements. The item may have various statements explaining that the moth is endemic to New Zealand, that it's perhaps that it's, um, it'll have images. So you can have, I will try and have an image of the egg, the catapult, the larva, the male and the female of the species um, so that you can have, that you can see the whole life um, stages of the insect. Um, it will have things like um, the, person who first described it, the year it was first described, hopefully a link to the first description so that you can then immediately just click on the link and it takes you to the piece of scientific literature that explains when this um, species was first described and who described it and how they described it. You can then also link to other items which may include synonyms, say the, the species names have changed, you can link to um, if it's an invasive species and it's invaded, I don't know, gone from New Zealand and gone into uh, the UK, for example, you can add statements to explain that. You can add statements about hosts. 
you can add whether the, um, the host not only of the, the larvae but also of the butterfly. So, and then when you go to the host, if it's a plant, you can explain when it was flowering. So once you've got all this data in there, the magic thing is you can then query it. And you can ask Wikidata with a Sparkle query to return answers to questions that otherwise would be extremely difficult to find the information in any other way. So to me, Wikidata is like this magic project where if you put the information, enough information in, you can pull out answers to questions that you would never be able to answer in any other way. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll actually, I'll do a bit of a share screen of my own in that case. I, I've got an example to hand that I think is quite a, a nice illustration of the sort of the weird multidisciplinary aspect of Wikidata, because I think particularly in the research world, we're used to our databases being highly specialised, and so they'll mm. only be on one specific topic. You know, protein databases are only about proteins. Uh, species databases are only about species. And one of the things about Wikidata is that because it's um, so multidisciplinary, it allows you to ask these sorts of um, uh, multi-topic questions like, um, this is one that sort of touches on both, um, both uh, biodiversity, but primarily kind of the sociology around that of, uh, let's look at instances of taxa, so biological taxa, species names, um, uh, genus names, family names, and things like that. Um, and tell me who they're named after, if it's named after a person. Um, if it is named after a person, tell me where they were born, and then let's draw that onto a map. And so we can then see a map of the world uh, where for species that have been named after a person, where was that person born? And you'll get the rather unsurprising answer that primarily within Northern Europe and to some extent America with a far smaller percentage across, let's say, the global south in general. Mm. Um, and so, you know, and even actually zooming in on some of these locations, particularly the colonial locations, um, a, a lot of them will be named after um, colonial administrators. So, for example, the, uh, in Borneo, um, what species are named after people who were born in Borneo? Well, the examples of species that are named after people born in Borneo, they're both named after this guy, Alfred Hart Everett, who was a British administrator in the 1800s. Um, so it, that, that's the sort of query that is relatively hard to pull out of another database and yet illustrates quite an interesting and I think quite profound uh, bias in even just the way in which species are named, let alone their, mm. their overall distribution. I was in a, I've been in a, a research group where we specifically used Wikidata so that we could visualize the um, results of our research, looking into um, plant genera named after women, because there wasn't a list. There just wasn't. We had to create it. We had to research it. Uh, we based it on some work of a, another um, author who had a book on it. But um, again, because it's a book, it's quickly out of date. And so we found new species, or sorry, new genera named after women after the publication of that book. And so created this database so that we could actually get a list of genera named after women because as I'm sure most people would have guessed, most of the genera are actually named after men. But there were more than we had anticipated. We started out, I think, with 16 or 17 named after genera in Wikipedia, and we are up to, I think, last count, it was over 500, perhaps 600 for women. Hmm. Just to back up what Siobhan was saying, um, this is the avatar moth, which is the species that's only found on the Deniston Plateau. And here it is in Wikidata, including, as she said, the taxon, what is it, it's named after, the parent taxon. Um, it's named after the movie Avatar. So it would actually be, uh, because Avatar is obviously a movie about giant mining conglomerates coming to destroy an indigenous environment. Uh, it's uh, it, we could do a, in fact we could do a search for you know species named after movies in Wikidata. It wouldn't be hard to do, but you'll see what it connects with is all of these other databases: Google Knowledge Graph, iNaturalist, 
the, threat, the New Zealand Conservation um, Database, um, New Zealand August, and, and GBIF as well, and so forth. So uh, Wikidata acts as a kind of a hub that connects together a bunch of different databases. But it's really important to have something in Wikidata because it also it helps generate that little Google graph, that box that you get when you do a, a search result. So someone looking for the Deniston Plateau will hopefully see this photograph popping up because it's the Wikidata item for the plateau. And Wikidata can also generate info boxes like the one over there on the right, which is in Commons, but it's generated just from the Wikidata description there. And you can use that you can use a little code to generate an info box in any other website drawing on Wikidata in that same way. So it's a tremendously useful and reusable database. Uh, and it's often um, neglected. People go straight to Wikipedia but it's an easy thing to get volunteers involved with is just making sure all the species or places or you know a list of every coal mine in Australia it would be great to have them all in Wikidata with a nice photograph of just how beautiful an open cast coal mine is uh, attached to the name for every Google search. I think that this is a, a useful actually thing to, to flag with the kind of the way in which Wikipedia and Wikidata sit alongside one another where you know Wikipedia is written primarily to be human readable it's written in prose it's illustrated with images um, it, it's you know made to be understandable by human readers and Wikidata is still understandable by human readers you know you've kind of seen the way it's structured in this sort of list like fashion but the way that it's structured is um, to be maximally readable by machine um, readers and AI and the sorts of things that are becoming increasingly important um, in modern research, modern decision making, um, kind of used in a huge range of um, activities. And typically, um, it, it's common for AIs and, and machine intelligence to be trained on proprietary data sets by particular companies and Wikidata is one of the few examples where there is this huge public open database that is not only open in the sense that people can anyone can view it but it is also open in the sense that it is community curated and generated and anyone is able to contribute to it and it's actually remarkably empowering for uh, it essentially, you know, any one of the people viewing this presentation at the moment could, if they wanted to, get involved in the way that Wikidata is organized, structured, annotated, curated, um, and have like really quite an outsized impact on the way in which AIs, which are otherwise very um, outside of the reach of most of us to influence, it's possible to actually influence them. Yeah. Um, I uh, since we've got uh, four minutes remaining on this, I'm going to ask one last question um, to everyone to give a quick answer to, and then I'll hand over to Ginny to to do a, a final wrap up comment. Uh, and that quick answer is, um, what one thing would you like to see improved in the way that Wikimedia covers? Um, topics related to climate change, um, whether it's Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wikicommons, any other project, uh, what one, one change would you like to see over the next five years? I don't mind going first. I want more. I want more, more knowledge, more data, more information, more images, more everything. It just, I just want more. That's what I want. In five years, I want to see an exponential growth in the information available to people about this topic. I would like to see the Wikimedia projects tackle video and animation much better than they have been. Photographs are great, but for many climate change discussions, we are looking at, say, animations of sea level rise or global changes in climate patterns or weather or videos of severe weather events or flooding. Um, those things are not as easy to find openly licensed versions of, and yet more and more people are expecting to see this kind of visual content to help them understand some of the big issues involved. So that would require collaborations with amateur and professional videographers, with news organisations, and with uh, research organisations that are producing this data. Please make sure that it's available under an open licence. Um, for me, I want to see at least like a, on a on a bare on a bare bone basis climate of insert the country name. So like uh, say especially uh, say 
uh, in the developing countries or the least developed uh, st uh, states as well. We know that uh, there's approximately like 190, 200 countries. We know that the developed countries are already practically already have their own, uh, but we know that a lot of these say oceanic countries, the, the chances are it's probably one or two sentences max, or sometimes they don't even have their own standalone article. They usually get shuffled into the part of the broader geography aspect. So I definitely want to see, say, five years from now, we would have a climate knowledge of, of every single uh, UN recognized nations around the world of like climate of say Tonga, climate of Nauru, uh, climate of uh, of Solomon Islands, for example. Uh, that's that's what I want to see five years from now. Thank you, everyone. I've really appreciated this discussion, and those are some great um, uh, thoughts to end on in terms of you know reach, coverage, scope, um, openness, and transparency. Um, I think that uh, this has been really helpful, um, both to me and I hope to our audience um, to get these voices um, all together. So I wanted to thank Siobhan and Andrew and Mike and long distance thank Alex um, for being such excellent panelists today. So thank you very much to you guys. And I shall finally pass over to Ginny for our OA week final wrap up. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you to all the panelists for an absolutely uh, fabulous um, uh, session. It was just really inspiring, and I think summed up a lot of the things that have come out of this week, which is sort of enthusiastic participation of the community. And really it, tying this into the open access um, movement, which I think has been incredibly powerful. Uh, so we've been planning this for several months. We've had a fantastic um, uh, panel involved in this. Uh, Richard White, Lookman Hayes, Donna Coventry, Sarah Roberts, Natalie Mudd, Zach Kendall, Anna Duchesne, Kate Davis, uh, Sandra Fry and myself. We've been working on this for several months now and it's been uh, tremendous. I hope you're inspired by it. I hope you'll kind of join and think more about how you can get involved in open access. Uh, we've got tons of res um, resources on our website and all of these videos will be up there um, uh, very shortly. Um, Please do um, think about open access in the context of your work, um, but also think about it in the context of, I guess, the wider society, which is something that's really come across this year. Um, we will see you in 2023 for another OA week then, but keep in touch between then. Thanks very much.